Hello, everybody. Welcome. I am Peter Marks with the Napa Valley Wine Academy. And today it is my pleasure to bring you another in our series of interviews with experts and authors from the Academy Duvan Wine Library. And today we have a really, really special guest, uh, Jasper Morris, Master of Wine, uh, a good friend of mine who lives and loves Burgundy. And we'll be talking about the, the new book just published by the Academy du Van on Burgundy. So for those of you who do not know Jasper, uh, Jasper is a master of wine who passed in 1985. Uh, he started in the wine business in 1979. And after getting a couple years uh, in retail experience in London, he founded his uh, company, the successful wine import specialist, Morris and Verdan, uh, which he sold in 2003 to Berry Brothers and Rudd. He continued to work for Berry Brothers and Rudd until 2017 as their Burgundy director. And today he is a Burgundy wine expert and critic. Mm -hmm. And he's also published his own book, as you can see there on the screen, Inside Burgundy. This book was published in 2010. It also won an Andre Simon Book Award and now is in its second edition. In 2018, Jasper also launched his own website called Inside Burgundy, where subscribers will find all of his tasty notes. And the other great thing about the Inside Burgundy is that Jasper is now including other regions of the world that produce Burgundian varieties such as Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. So for those of you who love those varieties as much as I do, uh, make sure you check out his website. And then finally, Jasper is a consultant for Sotheby's, the wine team that works uh, that he works with on behalf of the Hospice the Bone annual wine auction, which will be coming up in a few weeks' time. So with that, let's welcome Jasper Morris, Master of Wine, coming to us live from Burgundy today. Where, where exactly are you, Jasper? Well, I'm sitting uh, at home in my, in my little office. Um, uh, night has fallen here. It's uh, early evening. But uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, good morning to you. And it's great to see you again, Peter. And it's great to see you as well. We saw each other uh, this past summer at the annual, not the annual, but every four years, the Institute of Masters of Wine has their uh, symposium. And we were in Germany together and had a, had a good time. But uh, it's, it's nice to see you from afar, as always. But Let's talk about this wonderful book. Um, I just had a chance this past week to start to read through it. I have, I have to confess, I haven't read all the chapters, but uh, I wanted to know, um, you know, first of all, what, how did this book come about? What, what was the impetus for the, this wonderful book? Well, it's part of the series, which I think you already know, don't you, from the uh, Academy du Vin Wine Library. They've done on Champagne, on Burgundy, uh, not sure if what other titles, but there will be more. And the idea is that uh, the, the editor, Susan Kegel, who's a very smart lady, I must admit, um, and uh, she trawls through everything that she knows uh, and takes a look around for lovely pieces which have caught her imagination about the subject, so in my case, Burgundy, um, which have been written maybe in magazines, maybe they're extracts from books, uh, wherever else she can find them. And then she also commissions new pieces uh, in order to complete the picture. And what's very good is that she looks almost equally for, from, uh, for authors from the UK and from the US and a few from elsewhere. But it, it's a great balance, um, plenty of living, thriving authors and a few from the past. Yeah, no. And I know you wrote a few chapters. I've read those already. Those are wonderful. Um, other than writing the introduction and a few chapters, what other role did you have in producing this book? Okay, so in fact, my chapters are previous work, which uh, um, Susan was keen to include. I did, of course, write the introduction fresh, and I read every everybody else's pieces, and I suggested some editorial changes, and I suggested sometimes they could be moved somewhere else. Or in one or two cases, I said, well, we can start from there, but let's ask the author to angle it in a slightly different way. So, so yes, I, 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 as if I was part of the editorial board, if you like, uh, but really this is Susan's work. Yeah. And, and if a reader is to um, you know, purchase this book, and I hope they do, what would you say they would expect to learn? And is it something that's great for novices as well as, you know, maybe people studying for their diploma or master of wine? Well, I think so. Um, 
I think it's for wine lovers first because it's about the quality of the writing and it's about getting a feel for an understanding the region. But it's not going to give you the answers to write for your diploma or for, or for your master of wine. Uh, it, it's much more all round the subject. Um, but uh, I mean, I must say, I learned a great deal. And in fact, I, I challenged one or two received ideas which I had, which I had thought were absolutely solid. And somebody came up with a different opinion, and I had to go back and, and think about it a bit more. <laughs> That's great. Uh, and tell us how the book is organized. So you've got, I've got it in front of me, which is uh, looking away from the screen from time to time. Um, but you've got uh, nine chapters in all, each of which has got typically a half a dozen different um, authors. Some people are repeated. We've got uh, a couple of Hugh Johnsons, a couple of Doug Barzales, and so on. Um, but they are, uh, each chapter of the nine chapters is thematic. General themes often, uh, but they give the opportunity to bring together some uh, different pieces of work which, broadly speaking, are on the same aspect. So um, some are about the grapes, some are about the soil, some are about the people, some are about the marketing, uh, etc., etc. Um, but it, it's, it's not a book that you need to sit and read through, but you can just take a little chapter at a time, um, you know, one before bed uh, or in, in an idle moment, um, Wherever you're without your favorite podcast, you can dive into a chapter of this. Yeah, they're quite short. They're, like you said, it's very easy to pick up and just read a chapter or two and then um, and go on and do something else. But, you know, to me, it's almost I, just the, the sense I've gotten so far in reading a few chapters. It's almost like an insider's view. I mean, you learn this, these little tidbits of things that I didn't have any idea about. Uh, and I find that really fascinating. Um, in fact, I just I liked your your chapter where you talked about the stones uh, and you got you talked about how the walls are built up and how that reflects the soil. And and then you talked about the climats and the dwees and things like that, which, you know, again, that's something that's part of Burgundy, but it from a different perspective. Yes, I feel very close to the stones because when we bought our property here uh, around the, um, the garden area, um, the had been the old fashioned dry stone walls, which had fallen in. And so I taught myself how to rebuild them, and I found that absolutely fascinating. It's a complete mosaic, just like the vineyards of Burgundy. Yeah, and and I mentioned the word uh, clima and uh, the dui. I I know in teaching the, our WSET diploma classes that students often are confused by those terms. Can you maybe help us define what is the difference between a clima and a le dui? Not really, no. <laughs> it's, uh, it is so, uh, well, I don't know everything, do we? <laughs> but the best, the best thing to remember is that the word Yadi uh, just is the French word for a place name. It's an exact translation of the word place name. Uh, so it is just, you know, here's a spot that's been called that. And the Kima is more where that place name has come into a sort of a, a definition of an area of its own with a recognizable character. Mm -hmm. So would a climat be a, uh, a an official you know, vineyard parcel or um, you know, like a primer crew or yes. grand crew? But not always. Normally, right? normally yes, but um, I mean, you, oh dear, this is complicated. So, um, <laughs> Sorry to ask the question. There's a vineyard called Poma Clodes Epino, E-P-E-N-E-A-U-X. Uh, which is actually half in the uh, Lierdi of Pity or Little Epino and half in the Lierdi of Grand Epino. So the Pity and the Grand are both Lierdi uh, or Cru, you can call them as well, they are Premier Cru. But the Clovis Epino is a Klima which happens to straddle the both of them. Oh. Now, I think that's going to confuse people more than uh, elucidate. So, uh, yeah. uh, but I mean, it's, uh, it's an attempt to show what the difference is. And that's part of the fascinating part of Burgundy. It's it's not an easy subject to tackle, but it it is fascinating the more you learn about it, um, and there's always more to know it. Um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about Burgundy, but I'm curious first to find out how how did you first become interested in wine? Um, it happened uh, a tiny bit at school, um, um, but really it happened when I was at the university when there were various 
sort of uh, wine, um, uh, there's the wine circle, there's another wine tasting group, there was a blind wine tasting um, match every year, Oxford against Cambridge in the, the West English tradition. Um, and my sister was captain of the team and she bullied me into joining. And you don't really want to do what your elder sister tells you to do, but, but I did. Um, and, and that got me an interest and I didn't know what I wanted to do otherwise because I didn't want to join one of the obvious professions. My family have always been lawyers, and I knew that that wasn't going to suit me. It's, uh, my my brain isn't the right brain to do that. Um, so I found something else that, that I really did enjoy doing. Um, I did a sort of couple of years learning about it, uh, but I'd already met somebody in this in fact he's English, so he's very in rather than very down. Um, and uh, he said he had a, a couple of restaurants, and he said, why don't we start a wine importing business? So so that's what I did. And it was going to be all over France, not really other countries, but France. And even on that, that first year, when I'm different months, I would go around different uh, regions. Uh, Burgundy captivated me in a way that the others didn't. And Burgundy was, was hardly being handled in those days because there were the big old fashioned negotiation houses, uh, and a few sort of major importers. But otherwise, Burgundy was ignored. And it was just at the start of the domain bottle uh, movement. And because I met this incredible lady, Becky Rossman, who introduced me to those sorts of wines, and I just had the common sense to understand that I was onto something special. And uh, it came, I was in the right place at the right time, and it developed from there. Good. And, and you mentioned your sister. Um, I was fascinated. I didn't know this, but you and your sister studied for the Master of Wine at the same time. And, and, I, and I think Jancis Robinson was in that same group too, correct? She was a year before. She was 1984. Uh, okay. I took the in 1985, and my sister passed in 1986. But we are the only brother and sister masters of wine in the entire universe. That is amazing. <laughs> you learn something new every day. <laughs> One fact that people would be surprised to know, and I was planning to use that. But I'll have to yeah, right, right. So were you two study partners? Well, not really, because I mean we were working in 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 uh, different places. But we did what we tried to do is with a group of others we tried to meet every Sunday evening. Now in those days the study system was different to how it is now, and every every second Monday you would have a day release course. So we would meet in my apartment or somebody's apartment in central London on the Sunday night, and we would do some work together and have a blind tasting. And then whoever the host was would cook dinner and open lots of bottles. So unfortunately, it meant that we always went into Monday's course with horrible hangovers. Um, <laughs> it wasn't the best way of using the course system. But never mind, we got there. Yeah, that's great. Um, and so getting back to the book, are there any favorite uh, sections or chapters that you particularly like? Well, I sort of I keep dipping in at random, and a different thing occurs to me. Uh, but I really like the way that um, Douglas or Doug Barsley writes. So he's done something called A Delicate Topic in Burgundy, which is about wine fraud. And his other one, if I can lay my eyes on it, um, uh, Living On and On, which is more, uh, about aging Burgundy and the vintages. And he, of course, with Alan Meadows, has written a really extraordinarily fine book on the vintages of Burgundy from 1845 to, to the present day. Um, so, so he'd be one I would look out for. Um, you've got the sort of originally English, but uh, moved to America, um, uh, Gerald Asher, who has a beautiful way about writing about wine. He's a wonderful writer. Yes. Burgundy's Magic Mountain, which is about the Hill of Corton. Um, yeah, and then, I mean, really, it is very evenly divided between uh, either side of the Atlantic You've got one of the sections, six, is, is like short bites. It's called Wine Into Words. And so you've got uh, Jay McInerney, um, George Meredith, 19th century novelist, uh, H. Warner Allen, early 20th century, um, Hugh Johnson, of course, um, John Allett, who um, a big favorite of mine because he was uh, probably the world's best uh, uh, critic of the game of cricket, which is a, a, another weird joy of mine. And in fact, we were both born. We were both born adjacent to churches in the small town of Basingstoke, and we both have as passions 
cricket and wines, especially burgundy wine. So there's something in the temperature, obviously, of that, of that spot, spot. So, yeah. I mean, there are just a few, but everybody's going to want to take out something different from the book, and that, I think, is its strength. Exactly. And and I do love the fact that there are some uh, new pieces as well as some uh, published, yeah. republished pieces as well. And, you know, that makes me realize that there's been so many significant changes in Burgundy uh, in, in the past few years and decade or two. But what, what would you say are some of the most significant changes that you've witnessed? Well, obviously, in the last 10 years or so, it's been about the effects of global warming, warming and then people having to make changes in both viticulture and in the cellar. Um, and then what tends to happen is that you have your first idea about it, and then partly as a reaction to that, and partly as global warming gets um, increasing, then you actually have to backtrack and go off in a different direction. So I think the sweet spots on the slopes of the coat door have been changing a little bit. Um, first of all, it got better as you went up the hill, because they were in ways which were a bit cold beforehand, which are now warm enough to ripen the grapes. So that was great. Now that it's got drier as well as hotter, those tend to be rather arid spots, and they're suffering from drought stress a little bit. And instead, um, the pots which are at the bottom of the slope are doing well, because they used to get a little bit waterlogged, they had too much humidity, tended to have rather rough tannins as a result, um, and now they're becoming much more interesting. So the foot of the slope and a few appellations like Pomar are really going up in the world. Hmm. Interesting. Um, so are, are there changes in the vineyard practices that vignerons are trying to establish to deal with all of these changes or anything notable that you can mention? Well, slightly counterintuitively, um, people are raising their canopies higher. Now, mm. you, Peter, will know all the vineyards of France. Uh, it's obvious that in the cooler areas like Alsace, the canopies are very high. And in the hot areas, like Chateau neuf du Pape, they're right down near the ground. So you would have thought that if Burgundy got hotter, the canopy should go lower. But no, they've gone higher instead, which gives a little bit of shade from one row to another, because, of course, everything is very densely planted. So that can be quite good. You just have to make sure that you're managing your canopy correctly so that you don't have too much uh, transpiration, evaporation of the water through the leaves, and you get the positive size. So that's one thing. Um, people are no longer hedging the vines. Some people, this is very um, cutting edge, it sounds like a pun on the hedging. Uh, but instead they are uh, what they call tressing. They are uh, all the, the tendrils of the vine, uh, sort of rolling them around. Um, so that they don't go completely haywire, like the old style California school. Um, but equally, they are not cutting them, and that seems to be having an effect. And then they are putting a cover crop in and, it, and stopping plow, plowing. They're going for the no-till idea. Um, and that, so they tell me, uh, means that the soil stays a lot cooler under your cover uh, than if you have um, plowed it. Yeah. It's not very similar. Sorry? It's still all very experimental. So people yeah. are reacting, having ideas, but it takes a few years before you know if your idea is the right one or not. Right. And, and of course, there's a lot in the world of wine today about sustainability, organic, biodynamic. Um, are any Burgundian producers um, working with that in any, to any large extent? Oh, yes, more and more. And in fact, um, if you think about the big companies, uh, so I was at uh, Faverly today, but Faverly are in the middle of certifying their vineyards organic. So is Jadot, so are Bichot, so is Bouchard. Drouin has done it for a long time. Now, uh, Chanson is doing it. So that is the great majority of the well-established houses have all taken this direction. In addition to that, um, the majority of the really top-end producers um, cottoned on to this a little while ago. So, I mean, if you think about it, biodynamics is quite risky. I mean, it sounded like unscientific and weird woo-woo stuff when people began doing it. But who were the first? Uh, La Lou Bise de Wars, Domaine de la Romilly Conti, Domaine de la Fleur, La Fon, La Farge, people like that. 
people who were already at the top of the tree and therefore probably had the most to risk by uh, going out on this, this limb. But um, they looked at it and were convinced by it and had the courage to do it. Um, in the technical side of things, we're also seeing more people doing the whole cluster vinification in the res, um, which is interesting. So first of all, people were going in that direction because it seems to make the wines much fresher. And it also um, slightly reduces the alcohol. So both those two points seem very favorable for using whole clusters in a hotter climate. The negative is it actually decreases your acidity, it raises your pH, so you have lower acids, and that can be dangerous from the point of view of bacterial stability or volatile problems. So people are now scratching their heads and saying, okay, we think we like it, but we're also taking a bigger risk here. So those people that do the whole berry, in other words, including stems, um, would they do that year in and year out, whether they're, the stems are ripe or not? Uh, look, has there ever been a ripe stem? Uh, I mean, if you think about great exponents uh, of the, the, the whole um, cluster style, like the main Dujac, um, Jacques says he's doing it from his very first vintage, uh, you know, 1969, and there was going to be an awful lot of unripe years since then. So it's a style. It doesn't have to be fully ripe. There's a school of thought that insists that it should be, but I don't think that's all that important. Frankly, the issue is more to do with the size of the crop, because in 2022 and 2023, where by happy chance Burgundy has had two nice big crops in a row, people have got their winery organised with tanks which correspond to the size of their vineyard, and if they've got a full crop, uh, there's no room to put uh, the stems in as well, because uh, you need more space for that. So several people have told me that, okay, well, in 23, we haven't been able to do it as much as we would have liked to. The stems, how much extra volume would that uh, increase oh, over the over? I'm, I have no idea, but I'm going to say off the top of my head, 20%. Yeah, interesting. By the way, if... Um, if any of you out there have questions, uh, please go ahead and use the, the chat or the question function, and uh, I'll get those fed to Jasper as well. Uh, so you mentioned white uh, red wine burgundy winemaking techniques. Anything else that's happening with red wine that's sort of different, innovative, or interesting, whether that's well, in the maturation or winemaking? There's something which people are talking about, which would not be interesting at all, uh, which is changing the grape varieties. Now, actually, you can do this in white because you can put in aligote, and that is a great traditional burgundy grape, way older than Chardonnay. Chardonnay is a newcomer. We don't know when and why it started. We know its DNA origins, but uh, we can't tell when it came in for sure. Um, but it's within the last two to three hundred years. Aligote has been around forever, as long as Pinot Noir, and it's a grape which was you know, thin and awkward and. Uh, uh, only used really for blending before, uh, but now that it can ripen, so if you're risking uh, at the typical harvesting point, Chardonnay is at 14 and a half, 15, um, which is more than most Burgundians would like. I know it can work, I know it works super well in, uh, in California and Australia, but it is unusual for Burgundy. At that same time, your Anigote becomes ripe at 12 and a half degrees. Now, uh, we have discovered, because a few bright young things have begun making um, single vineyard aligotes, mostly from land that's uh, unfamous, so they're not inside the village and Tomio Crew Appellations, stand at the generic end, but they're making four or five different wines, and you can see every bit as good a translation of terroir with aligote as you can with Chardonnay. So I think we will start to be allowed to mix aligote in the vineyards, even of some of the senior appellations. And if we think back in the 19th century, Porto Charlemagne in Grand Cru was basically aligote. And I think it will work wonderfully on that side. So I'm, I'm, I'm for that introduction to white. But can you, you can't imagine growing Syrah or Grenache or, or some hybrid grapes which have been invented for purpose uh, in Musigny or Richebourg or, or, or Chambertin. You might make a drinkable wine, but you won't make a drunk food the way we love them. 
That's an that's a, a interesting thing about Ali Gote. I mean, I'm familiar with uh, you know Buzaran as an appellation that uses that exclusively. Uh, are there other places in Burgundy where you find Ali Gote to be showing some great possibility? Well, I'll just give a plug for some of my friends in in Houston, Texas, who actually came up with a. I think the uh, master sommelier Stephen McDonald might have been the guy who did this, but they came up with a rap song about the. Uh, Tell your sommelier to get you Ali Gate, and, uh, and on it goes. It's really nicely done. Um, but yeah, sorry, come back to your question. Repeat if you don't mind. Uh, the question is where where else do you find, other than uh, Buzeron in the Cote Chalonnet, other locations where Ali Gote has uh, shown some great possibility? Well, all around the hill of Corton, Caron Vergeles, uh, Corton Chalamine, and the backside of that hill as well which is not classified as village. All those places are very smart for Aligote. Um, it seems to be working up around Marcinet near Dijon, but that's more to do with a few guys like um, <clears throat> um, uh, Sylvain Papay and Laurent Fournier have just taken it to their hearts and uh, there's some generic land which they could play around with and, uh, and make a good result. Uh, and also up in uh, near Chablis, um, up in the Yon, uh, there's a village called Chitri, a little bit further up on the hill. Uh, you've got Sauvignon Saint Brie on one side, and you've got some really nice Aligotes from up there too. So they would be, they would be my other points really to look for Aligotes. Good. And it's well, not it sounds, yeah. <laughs> sounds like something yeah. to, for us to keep, uh, keep an eye on in the future. A, a nice fresh wine. Now, Aligote um, is often used for sparkling wines for the Cremant de Bourgogne. Is that true? Is that still? Um, not, it, it's included in many, um, partly because the grapes are cheaper and of course because it's uh, lower alcohol and good acidity. Uh, I don't think there would be many which would be pure aligote. I know I've tasted them, but that would be uh, unusual. However, it is a useful blending tool. Yeah. And speaking of Cremant de Bourgogne, I, are you seeing an increase in those wines given the overall popularity of sparkling wines today? Yeah, yes, uh, I, I read the figures and there appears to be a, a greater interest. Um, I don't sort of see it around in the in the sort of heavy, the totally committed Burgundy wine drinking community. They tend to be into Grosse Champagnes as well uh, as uh, another line of drinking. Um, but it does seem to be going well, and there are some some quite smart people doing a good job. Uh, so, so yes, and you'll find that there are one or two sections. Uh, there's a little part of the Cote d'Or called the Châtillonnet, right in the north of uh, the part of the Cote d'Or, which is almost entirely given over to the sparkling stuff. Um, and there's many a grower who might have uh, some of their uh, sort of excess uh, wines from um, cooler parts, they might turn into a sparkling wine. Interesting. So with white wines, uh, you know, one of the topics that's been around for a number of years is this premature uh, oxidation or premox. Is that um, still an issue today? And, um, you know, I know it's associated with white wines, but this does that ever affect red wines as well? Uh, so it's associated with white wines. It affects all white wines around the world, but Burgundy get, is the poster boy for it simply because uh, I suspect it's mainly because, at any rate, um, most people who are going to put some white wines away in their cellar for longer aging, it's likely to be white Burgundy. Or it could be something like German Rieslings, which have uh, some residual sugar, so a bit more sulfur and higher acid level, which gives you more protection. But all wines uh, that I, I think have had some um, problems with this. Uh, in our in our relative youth, um, uh, Peter, everybody always told us that uh, white Rhone wines, you had to drink them very young, or wait 20 years, and they seemed to be oxidized in between. Now, it was a much warmer climate down there, and I think that as the world has warmed up, we're getting that exact phenomenon, which has moved further north. Now, there are loads of other um, explanations, and I'm not going to go into all of them because we'd be drowning in uh, technical points. Um, but people have worked pretty hard to get rid of it. It does still exist, and where you see it is in the vintage that's about five years old, 
suddenly it goes a little bit darker in colour and it goes duller and you get this bruised apple nose which uh, I associate uh, with uh, oxidation. But I'm fairly convinced that it is a phase that it goes through. Now, if you've opened the bottle, that's too bad, that's too late, it's not going to come back. But what I beg people not to do is to chase, throw good wine away after bad. So if you've had that experience, don't open another bottle with the same thing. Choose something different. If you've got that wine in your cellar at home, don't. I hear people saying, you know, I had a case of it and I had to throw 10 bottles down the sink. If one's not good, it's just not the right time to drink that wine. And for example, in my, I bought a lot of 1996 white Burgundy. They're really believed in this vintage. And from 2002 or three, when the problem first became apparent, through to 2010, they were pretty much undrinkable. And from 2015 onwards, every time I opened one, I haven't had a single dud bottle. So not everybody, in fact, the majority of people don't believe in my theory, but I do. And I, I really think now that people have made an effort to minimize it happening in the first place, I think it is a fairly sound position to take uh, that you just have to wait out the period when it's not looking great. I have not heard that theory. That That's yeah, really, yeah. really fascinating. That is a, so for those of us um, you know, who aren't too familiar with premature oxidation, um, what is the cause of it in the first place? Do we know? Uh, that, that, uh, it's multifactorial, uh, which makes it difficult to put a finger on. Uh, so I've suggested the warming and, and a, a slightly different composition in the grapes is one aspect of it. Uh, there are various things which then allowed it to happen when it had the potential to happen before. They didn't cause it, they allowed it to happen. The change in how corks were delivered in and around 96 was a huge factor. Uh, so they changed the treatment, the corks were also less dense, because at that point we had almost nobody using screw caps, uh, and yet the international world of winemaking had blossomed. So you've got some really poor corks, so they can be improved, or indeed moved to a diam or some other uh, equivalent cork, um, not cork rather, but uh, alternative closure. Uh, people are taking much more care to make sure they don't get variable levels of dissolved oxygen in their wine at the bottling. Um, but the particular point that I like to make is that it was a philosophical thing at a period in which red burgundy was absolutely the new favourite and people describe it as a ballerina, it's all about the purity and the elegance and the finesse and not about weight and muscle. People started trying to make their chardonnays in the same way. But chardonnay is a completely different sort of grape. And I, it's, it's muscular, it could be a rugby player or an American footballer or Aussie rules or whatever. Um, but it, it needs to be made in that way. And what people were doing was cleaning up their juice enormously. So you press, and they're using the hydraulic presses, sorry, no longer the hydraulic presses, now the pneumatic presses, which press much cleaner. They weren't keeping the solids at all, so they were putting nearly clean juice into uh, the barrels. Now, what are those solids all about? They are largely phenolic extracts uh, from the skins and other things, but mainly the skins. And you know how important the skins are in making red wine. Well, they're absolutely important in making white wine too. I'm not suggesting you have to go as far as making an orange wine, but you just need a little bit of an effect. And the old hydraulic presses, they mashed up the skins while doing that pressing. So they gave you some effect, and people, more people used to crush the grapes before they pressed them in the past, than they don't now. Again, that gives you a little bit of a skin contact, even if it's only an hour or two, it helps. Um, so those things, I think, are, are really important. And also, the fact of having the skins means that uh, there's much less risk of oxidation in a red wine, so I have, in certain vintages, I have slightly found it. There are a few 2002 red burgundies, um, which which I felt evolved a bit more quickly, possibly for that reason. But it's not widespread, and it's not something that people need to worry about. Correct. Uh, yeah, I don't know if this is related, but there's the you know the new 
kid on the block, so to speak, that so-called natural wines or wines made with minimal intervention. And I know the French have sort of come up with their definition of natural wine. Um, is that something you see very much in Burgundy today? A little bit. Uh, in If you count Beaujolais as part of Burgundy rather than a separate region, then there's a whole load of it there. Um, the risk is with the totally unsalted wine, the question is how long can you age these for? And if you've got a Grand Cru which is costing an awful lot of money and which traditionally the view has been that if you do age it for 10, 15, 20 years, it isn't just that it gets older, but it starts to deliver a great deal more. You're putting that at risk if you make it completely without sulfur. Um, I'm finding there are two groups of people who are going down. That I don't like to use the word natural because, frankly, the other people are not being industrial and unnatural in the way that uh, some of the real evangelists insist that they are. Um, <clears throat> but uh, anyway, if you do make wine without sulfur, there, there are two groups. One is who says, uh, the sort of person who says, whatever the wine tastes like afterwards, that's what wine should taste like because I've made it naturally. And you can see some terrible deviations, uh, things which we have always regarded as flaws. And they're saying to me, no, that's what wine should taste like. I love drinking this. You're, you're just, you know, you, you haven't understood anything. And then there's the other crowd, very thoughtful, reflective people. And I buy a lot of my wine for drinking through such people who will work without sulfur as much as they can. If the year tells them no because the grapes are just not healthy as they come in, or there's some other spoilage imminent, then they will put some sulfur in. But they hate deviations every bit as much as I do. And then you get this astonishing purity in the wines, and I really love them. But I tend to buy less famous appellations uh, uh, from for that style of wine, because they are better drunk when they're young, uh, rather than put away in the back of the cellar. Yes, so so I, I see where you are in this uh, in the camp of make wines with minimal intervention, but if necessary, you know, take precautions, use sulfur as needed. Correct. Yes, but but also just have the the the, the due diligence that they're following their wines the whole time. They're tasting, they're analyzing, they're making sure they nip things in the bud. They they stop it ha happening. So there's <clears throat> one person in particular I'm thinking of who never uses sulfur for vinification. The wine goes into the barrel, and then as it comes to the moment when he can think about bottling them, he will taste each barrel and decide which ones can be made without sulfur, and which ones where he thinks they won't be stable, particularly if they travel to uh, uh, an external country. Uh, and those he will put a, a little bit of sulfur in, still not a huge amount, and then um, he will label the two differently. So it'll be the same vineyard, and, uh, the same appellation, same vineyard, but one has one style of label and the other has a different style of label. And then you can choose which way you want to go. And uh, frankly, I think that is, that is a super smart way of doing it. That, that is a great way to do it, yeah. So I, I hate to bring this subject up, but um, <laughs> for those of us who love Burgundy, uh, we have seen the demand of Burgundy wines just, you know, skyrocket in the, in the last decade or so. And commensurate, commensurate with that is the price increase. So what is going on in Burgundy today? Okay, so people talk about prices and it's the price they see on you know, some web. It could be a, a website like Wine Searcher where you can look up and see everybody's price. Now, in fact, they are unwittingly part of the fault because what happens in Burgundy where there's not a lot of um, liquidity in the, in the product, uh, somebody puts up a high price and everybody else is, what has been happening, everybody else then says, wow, that's the market price, and they adjust their prices to match it, um, which you couldn't do in Bordeaux because there's such a large volume of any one chateau. So that's why the secondary market has gone crazy. And I would emphasize that mostly it is the secondary market that has created those prices, and it's not the price being asked by the producer themselves. Um, now, it has then tempted a few people to go up enormously in pricing. Um, and everybody has right, um, increased their prices a fair amount because they just have such incredible demand from everywhere in the world. Um, so I started being a Burgundy specialist back in the late 1980s. 
And it took until around about the end of the 90s before I could persuade anybody not to buy Burgundy. And I think supply and demand was about in balance from, let's say, 99 to 2005. Then you had the great 2005 vintage, by which time you also had um, the beginning of everybody being used to a, a sort of website technology. And suddenly, everybody in the world, every country in the world, wants Burgundy, and everybody can see what's available and what the price is. So that's what's dri driven it out. And the two things which I'm doing at the moment to try to calm it, one is I am, whenever I go traveling the world or doing occasions like this tonight, um, or today for you, um, I'm trying to say to people, just stop buying it if the price is too far different from what the grower intended. I had a group from Orange County, in fact, came through at the beginning of this year, and we went up to Chablis for a day, and I took them to a restaurant, uh, knowing that they would enjoy one particular aspect, which was that it had some good vintages from the main Ravenel, uh, for many people, the absolute non pareil of Chablis. Uh, bottles with a little bit of age, but only just recently delivered by the domain. And they looked at the wine list, and they said, these are crazy prices. And I said, no, your prices are crazy, because the price in the restaurant was one-tenth of the current LA retail price. And yet, the producer has made the margin they want, the restaurateur has made the margin he wants, everybody's happy, and people get to drink great wine. And they can flock to Chablis in order to do it. So that's the way that Ravenel has tried to get round this horrible secondary market inflation, is by putting a whole load of wine out into local restaurants, some down in Bone as well, but, but several in Chablis, and everybody has agreed to play the game of not putting on um, uh, offensive margin, just by standard margin. It's really good. Um, so, so that's been the problem with the secondary market, uh, which I'm trying to counter and tell people, just don't chase after it. There's so much great wine in the world. If you see one thing at a really high price, say, no, I'm out, um, and find something else. Um, and one of the things I try to do with my website is not tell people that this is the new star of tomorrow and try to create artificially this market. But just if you read through uh, without any fanfare, you'll see where the good wines are. And then ideally, you can go and get them calmly rather than in a stampede. <coughs> so the other thing I'm doing, every single tasting, and since um, the first Monday in October, I have spent every day from 8 a.m. till 6 p.m. Uh, in the cellars tasting them in 2022. And every time I ask people what they're doing with their prices, and if they hesitate or ask my opinion, I think, stop going up. You know, this is now the time. People are pushing back. You risk damaging the image of Burgundy if you go and bring the prices up. You've got lots of wine in your cellar in both 22 and 23, so you're going to make plenty of money as long as you... But you really don't put the price up any further. And um, I'm hearing back from them that they're in agreement with that. The majority of them. That that's good news. That's good. Uh, let's hope that that's the case coming, especially with two good size yeah. vintages, as you mentioned. I, and I should mention, I'm, 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 working to, I'm working to you guys to try and make sure it is. One of the things that uh, I just thought I'd mention because I think it's important um, in your uh, in inside Burgundy on your website when you rate wines, you give an overall score. You know, like ninety. 91, whatever. But you also put a value rating on that. To, can you explain a little bit how that works? Because I think that's a good way for consumers to understand the price and the value uh, ratio. So if we go back and just talk through it, so I don't think Robert Parker was actually the first, but he was certainly the person who made it really, really happen. Perhaps he was the first, I don't know. that may not be right. He was the person who put the 100 point scale on the map. And if people in the UK used points at all, it would be a 20 point system. Basically, they're the same because a 20 point system starts at 10 but uses half marks, and a 100 point system these days starts at 80. So, you've really got 20 units to work with either way. And uh, nowadays, 80 is, 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 is horrible, and so is 10. So, it really starts at 15 out of 20 or at 90 out of 100. So, there has been a point of inflation. But the real problem is if somebody makes a great basic Bourgogne Rouge or Blanc, it probably is going to be better than somebody who makes uh, a bad wine out of a Grand Cru Charme Chambertin. But there's no way it can be better than a really good Charme Chambertin. 
So you've got to have a, po a point differential, which means that your really good Bourgoin Rouge can't easily score, it would be very rare for it to score more than 90 points. But if it's 90, nowadays people are going to dismiss that and not care about it. So a great Bourgoin Rouge scoring 90 is going to get five stars. And that gives you a different way to see that here is a special wine that's top of its class. If you give 90 to a Musigny or a Chambertin, that's pretty disappointing for an expensive Grand Cru. So that's going to get sort of probably at best two stars. Um, one star would mean it was actually defaulted. And a 90 point Musigny just means it's an ordinary wine that, that doesn't merit its, its appellation. Um, so that's the way of, of giving a fair crack of the whip to the lesser appellations. And also enabling people to say, okay, my price point is around here. These are the sorts of appellations that I want to buy. Uh, let's take a look at the four and five star wines, and then I'm going to find what I want. In your tastings, have you found any part of Burgundy for both white and red wines that tend to offer uh, excellent value? And maybe maybe that's based on producer. I don't know. But any any tidbits or advice for people looking for something they can afford? Well, in the whites, um, Chablis and the Maconnet remain extremely good value. And there are some beautiful wines in both areas. I've been worried about uh, whether the uh, heat is going to do more damage there, even though they're in the cooler north. But it's a style of wine that needs to be cool and fresh. So the 22s are looking very smart there. So good luck, that's going to work. And down in the south, in appellations like the Frise, um, they're used to having a certain amount of sunshine. And the extra sunshine, it might have put up an extra half degree to one degree of alcohol on, but basically it hasn't changed the style of the wine. And there is a whole crowd of exciting younger producers in the Maconnet, in the small Macon village vineyards perhaps, uh, who are doing some lovely work at affordable prices. It's a little bit more complicated up in the Cote d'Or, but again I would go for the what would have been considered the second division villages, places like Sarama, uh, au um, you can get some really very nice wines there. And because the price has gone up a little bit, not stupidly in those villages, it enables people to start paying the money to make the wine as well as people would always have made Pinot Noir and so on. So uh, that's definitely a good hunting ground. And in the reds, you can look at both ends of the Côte d'Or, so Marcenet at the uh, top end, in Dijon and uh, Marange at the bottom end, and uh, you're getting good value here. Yeah, good challenging. Yeah, I mean, it, it gets discovered as sort of Burgundy's forgotten region every so often, uh, and then it goes off to boil again. What it's lacked is having a clear leader, but there are more domains now making smart wines. They're beginning to work together instead of just trying to sell their own individual domain wines. I like um, Givry is probably my favourite village for the Reds. Really making good wines in both colours. Mercury um, is the most famous of the Red villages, but what's needed to happen is to improve the stock of Pinot Noir there, which is happening. People are beginning to pull out the plantations of the old style, which was planted in order to make the biggest yield possible. Like always gives you some rough and rustic tannins at the back. So as that changes, then Mercury is, is growing as well. And then Montaigne, um, the all-white one at the southern end, is interesting because you get just a sort of, as if you had 20% of Chablis in it. There's something about the soil structure in Montaigne which gives you a little bit of that, that shellfish idea. Only a bit. I mean, you won't actually mistake it for a Chablis, but there's a hint in there. So yeah, there's plenty, plenty of interesting stuff in the first one Yeah. Well, we've talked a lot about Burgundy. Uh, we have one of our uh, listeners today has asked you, once asked you a question, other than Burgundian regions, what are your favorite non-Burgundian regions making Burgundian style wines? I think it comes down often to individual producers in small districts. So um, we, we became also quite well known in, in London as California wine importers. Purely because one day my neighbour Becky Wasserman here uh, gave me a glass of red wine and said, "What do you think of that?" It was obviously a young Pinot, obviously really good. I said it was a Michel Lafarge Bonnet, uh, and it was Jim Clendenin's Obontima Pinot Noir. So 
instead of saying, yes, it is very good, but it's sort of, you know, slightly short on the mid palette or inventing, inventing some reason to talk it down. I said, wow, you know, how, how do I get to meet this guy? And uh, she got the bottle open because he'd been to see her earlier that day. And uh, it turned out that yeah, it was probably the house here. We were staying at the same hotel, so we hooked up. And then later in the year, I went out to downtown uh, um, Santa Maria, I suppose. Met him at the winery and started importing his wines and then a load of other people's. I love that part of the world in the Central Coast uh, because... Um, whether or not the, they would argue that the um, climate is, is cooler, but the pricing is cooler as well, or, or has been, until some people on the Santa Rita Hills have started getting a lot of claim for their wines. In Oregon, things have gone very well. Uh, New Zealand is a favourite of mine, not just Central Otago, but several other places, North Canterbury, um, Martin Brewer a bit. Australia I know less well, but parts of Victoria, Tasmania, they are so keen to make world-class Pinot Noir in Japan, though the humidity of the climate is against them. But even so, you can imagine that the uh, efforts, the integrity and the, the drive of some of those people, it's coming along quite nicely. In fact, um, I'll just say to everybody listening in, um, where I met Peter this summer was at the Moscow Wine um, Symposium in Wiesbaden in Germany, and the panel which I ran was uh, people making <coughs> Pinot Noir in two different continents. So he had a Burgundian who, in fact, didn't show his Burgundy wines, but he showed his Japanese Pinot and his Santa Rita Hills Pinot. We had an Australian girl who's also now living full-time in Burgundy, and she still makes an Australian wine, but she's making Burgundy. Uh, we had um, a, a German who makes wine in New Zealand as well. And it's always in, it was interesting to find from these people how making wine in the new place might have made them rethink what they did in the old place. The other member of our panel... Uh, is making wine in South Africa, uh, but they also have a small project in Oregon as well. So it was really, really interesting to see uh, how Pinot you know, can translate, but also what lessons you have to unlearn when you make it in a different place. Chardonnay, of course, is wonderful and grows beautifully almost everywhere in the world. Um, and I, in fact, have a rather naughty theory that the reason it's called Chardonnay is after the French word Chardon, which means a thistle. So basically, Chardonnay is a weed in the ground which will grow everywhere without any difficulty. So, uh, this may not be true, but I quite like it. Yeah, and, and just to comment on the, the tasting you did at the symposium, I, I remember that Japanese Pinot Noir, and it, it was a true eye-opener. It was amazing how fresh and bright and elegant that wine was. It was really, really delicious. So... Yeah, Hokkaido is weird because it's, it seems like the Japanese version of Alaska. It's under snow for four or five months of the year. Uh, you know, they've got the wonderful fresh salmon and they've got the bears in the forests and all the rest of it. And yet, if you look at a map and follow it closely, it's on the same latitude as Chateauneuf du Cap, as well as France. Weird. But anyway, um, sorry, I, I digress. No, no problem. Uh, at, you know, at the beginning, I mentioned that you are working with uh, Sotheby's for the annual Hospice the Bone Auction, uh, and which comes up in uh, a few weeks time. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And I assume you will be attending this year. I would indeed. So um, I was taken on as a consultant. I mean, I'm employed by Sotheby's, but it's absolutely just for this job of the Hospice auction. So it's not like any other wine auction, because instead of seeing what wines you can get in in order to sell for application. It's the produce of the new harvest of all the vineyards which actually belong to the hospital, which have been bequeathed over the centuries to the hospital. Uh, I mean, it's huge. It's, it's 60 different vineyards, um, 50 separate wines, at any rate, over 100 different pots. It's massive. Um, and uh, very skillfully made by Ludivine Grubo. Uh, both colors were about two-thirds red, one third white. So the wines have just gone into barrel. I'm going to taste them all on Tuesday, and I will then uh, write up my tasting notes by the end of that uh, next week, and they'll be up on the Sotheby's website um, for anybody who's interested. And since the change in how it's done in 2005, normal human beings, civilians, can now buy barrels at the auction instead of just the local um, merchants. Uh, and it's it's a period of great festivity over at least three days, but it continues either side in Burgundy. 
And it, it just sort of is the start of a whole new season, if you like. So I'll be tasting away these incredibly young wines. Um, we'll only just have finished fermentation uh, to see what they taste like. But we're expecting very good news from 2023. It's a big crop. Uh, the whites were clearly going to ripen and they just look gorgeous all the way through. The reds, two weeks before harvest, uh, it's a vast crop and it really didn't look as though it was going to turn out to be anything really special. And then we had this super heat wave for all the first two weeks of September, which completely ripened that crop. And we're, we've ended up, I think, with some pretty special reds. But, uh, and uh, I'd rather I'd rather pronounce on that when I've tasted them, but there's a lot of optimism. Good, I hope so, and we'll 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 see if those prices uh, sort of hold their their place as you've wished for as well. Yeah, I think they'll be down. Uh, I mean, obviously, one half of me wants to get the best possible prices because all the money goes to the hospital and some other charity. I mean, it re it it really does. It, it doesn't get sort of creamed off elsewhere. Um, and um, so I want the most money for that charitable cause, but at the same time, I also want to keep the marketplace sort of cool and calm. So we are expecting, I mean, the world isn't a particularly happy place at the moment, so we're probably expecting lower prices this year after breaking all records the previous two years. Good. Well, we're almost out of time, but I do have a couple of quick questions. Um, the first one is, do you have a favorite Burgundy wine that you've tasted? Not really. I mean, you know, it's about the diversity. Wouldn't it be sad if you only stuck with, with one? What I do find, though, is that you taste the wine and this big smile comes on your face. And it can be a little baby wine, or it can be a great wine, and of course, it doesn't have to be burgundy. And you just know that that wine has been made as well as that wine could have been made. Uh, you know, and that's where my five stars come in. And it gives you so much pleasure, so much happiness. So um, I'm drinking loads of relatively inexpensive burgundies at home. Well, we like to have a bottle of wine every evening, so many of them are inexpensive. I don't know. Um, sort of, I'm going to I'm going to leave out the, the sort of ultra grand crus and just pick a, a couple of vineyards at the premier cru level, which I happen to adore. And one is Merceau Chenevrier because of the finesse and delicacy and really the subtlety of that wine compared to more powerful Perrier or Charm. And then for red, why don't I choose Chevrolet Chambertin Cestier, so the neighbour of the really famous Clos Saint-Jacques. But there's this lovely mineral thread in every Cestier that just appeals to me at the moment. If you ask me next year, I could give you different answers. Great. Well, I, I agree with your choices. Those are good ones. Um, and my last question is for you. Um, we've learned a lot about you so far today, and it's been fabulous. What is one thing that people would be surprised to learn about? of you. Anything surprising about you? I know you love cricket now. It's something, anything else interesting about you that people might be interested to know? Well, I, uh, I mean, it's possibly worth saying that my sister and I both became masters of wine. We came from a non-wine uh, drinking uh, background. I mean, my, my parents both drank spirits and my father had to stop because he didn't drink too much of them. Uh, my mother continued with a weird mixture of gin and ginger beer. Um, so we just didn't have wine at home, so it's weird that we both um, became um, uh, masters of wine. Uh, hey, what, other, what else can I tell you? I don't know. Um, the best is well, going to tell right? Inside Burgundy to find more inside information from you. So we do have to, I'm, I'm afraid we have run up to the hour, but um, this, is, this has gone by too fast, and we want to make sure that everybody has a chance to don't forget to buy this book because it is a fabulous on Burgundy. For, uh, there's a link there where you can order the book. Uh, I think the price is around 45 US dollars. So lovely book. You can read uh, bits and pieces of the whole thing. In one fell swoop. Uh, but again, Jasper, you have been just a fabulous guest with us today. I want to thank you for your time. Thank you for your insights. On and, uh, well, let's Sorry, sorry, Peter, to uh, interrupt. If I can make a small plug, uh, my book in the States is uh, available through Sotheby's Retail in New York, and some of the times it's on Amazon. I don't know if it is at the moment, um, but you, you can you can find it through Sotheby's. Yeah, and and subscribe to your website as too. It's a it's a great yeah, website. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, and enjoy the holiday season, which is coming up, and drink some great Burgundy.
Cheers to all of you. Thank you.